What's up, guys? Welcome to the Build Show Podcast. I'm your host, Matt Reisinger, coming to you from the Rockwell Studios here in Austin, Texas. And we've got a part two of last week's episode where we talked about really the new definition or defining building science for uh, a new generation of will build houses. And I've got a thought leader, a building scientist, a longtime friend with me, Christoph Irwin. Christoph, thank you for joining me. Um, we're going to be spending a few minutes today kind of breaking down the building science topic a little further, talking about resilient systems. So with that in mind, resilient systems, let's get going. All right, guys, Christoph Irwin, we I introed him last time, but this is a man that uh, I've been friends with for at least 13 or so years, right, Christoph? Oh, uh, wow. He, uh, gosh, he's done a lot of things. He was a Navy engineer for many years. Mm -hmm. uh, he was a builder for many years. Mm -hmm. But I've got to know Christoph for the last 12 or 13 years as he's owned uh, a company called Positive Energy here in Austin, which traditionally has been a mechanical design firm, or not traditionally, in the past I've thought of them as a mechanical design firm, where really the last 12 years, just about every house I've built, minus a couple, they've done the planning for me on a really good HVAC system for the house. Yep. Manual J, uh, equipment selection, how to run the ducts, where the ducts go, what size the ducts are, uh, and they give me a killer set of plans that I hand to my mechanical contractor in the field and say, all right, guys, here's the plans. Just like we give our frame carpenters uh, a set of plans to build off, we give our mechanical contractor a set of plans to build off. But his firm is doing more than that. If you missed part one of this, check that out. They're doing really um, what I would consider kind of building science planning for yeah. the building at the early stage of design, which is really the conceptual stage or the schematic stage, kind of depending on how you you call it, mm -hmm. where there's still some flexibility, there's still some ability to change things, and it doesn't cost much to change things. Right. Uh, and Christoph, you and I talked last time about how the further that train goes down the tracks on design, uh, such that I've got a, a fully baked, fully engineered set of plans, if a client says, hey, I want to make this or that change, it's it's darned expensive to do that. And it, once we get into construction, it even gets even more expensive to do that. Absolutely. So this pre-planning, this thoughtfulness uh, is really what we are talking about is thoughtfulness mm -hmm. is vitally important. Now, we're going to phase two on that thoughtfulness today, though, right? Yeah, we're going to be talking about resilient systems. And I just want to react to a couple of things you said. So on the name Positive Energy, I don't think it's ever been stated publicly how we came up with the name. It was a reaction to uh, net zero. Okay. And we were, you know, net zero energy. We were saying, why not net positive energy? Why stop at zero? And then it was a, a little play on health, like mm -hmm. positive energy, like, like chi or, you know, yep. I don't know what the other words, but just health. Yep. And then it was also like, um, yes, we can, you know, it was I like, let's it. do this. We you can know, do this. We can make it better. And that brings up, you know, where we are today. So the mechanical designs are important. Um, architects design. They have the design function and builders have the construction function. Mm -hmm. uh, structural engineers design and framers frame. Mechanical engineers design and installers install, right? That's so right. generally speaking, that's, that's how the logic applies. And, and you were an early adopter. But in that context, I mean, it's great that it happens and, not but, and it's also true that it is reacting to the architectural design. It's mm -hmm. like, here, here's the design. It's done now design a mechanical system to fit it. That works with this. And so what we have, and you and I together are now working on, I mean, we did a project in 2019 where we did the, what we're talking about today. It was one of the first ones where we're saying, while this architectural design is fluid, like it's in concept phase or early schematic design phase, let's tell everyone all the performance factors, performance outcomes that it's going to lead to. Right. Um, so energy and daylighting and glare. That's what we went through today. We're going to be talking about resilient systems. But first, a little recap. I love it. So I'm showing a bunch of gears again. We talked about that last time. This idea is so important. And all of you in the industry, you know, if you could start to see that you let's say you're a builder. Well, all around you, you have different interlocking uh, wheels like you have architects over there and then you interact with your engineers and then you call your 
account rep at BMC over here. And then, oh, I just gave a plug for BMC. And then you call a trade. It's actually Builders First Source who oh, sponsors the podcast, BFS, by the way. BFS, <laughs> excuse me. Oh, look at that. I walked right into that one. <laughs> well done, Christoph. Way to plug BFS. Distributors, developers, appraisers. The point is like, we're all working together. And if one of those gears is like, I don't know, like, I don't know, this may be a little too political, but we have had some architects or builders tell us their client doesn't believe in solar, mm -hmm. right? You know, we know what that means. Like they believe it exists. They just don't want it. That's, that's fine. Um, it's important to know early on, we can provide other ways to get them energy, but in terms of that interlocking wheels, right? That's a wheel that when it comes to resilient systems, that wheel is a little bit, there's friction on yeah. it. It's not yeah, ready yeah. to keep spinning. That's right. And I, I hope I didn't sound moralistic. No, we, we don't. We don't build houses for uh, just Republicans or just Democrats. Right? <laughs> uh, we're an equal opportunity right. uh, money taker when it comes to clients. There you go. Um, but it is interesting to see that someone uh, is able to visual or not visualize to verbalize early in the project. This isn't important to me. Right. And um, it's important that it, 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 everything we're talking about starts. In fact, I wish I had mentioned it on part one starts with a long, slow, detailed interview of the owner. Mm, I love that. And um, what's important to you? Exactly. And so it, 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 it really is about the owner. And a lot of times if you know, you sit down with an owner and you'll say, so how important is air quality to you? And you, you just get a look on their face. You're like, I hadn't even considered that. It's very important to me. Of course it's important, but I never right. thought about it. Before. How important is it that you have clean water for drinking? Um, oh, is my water not clean? Well, right now, you know, 2021, uh, PFAS, per and polyfluoroalkylene substances are being found in many, many drinking water systems. Reverse osmosis can take that out. So mm -hmm. at your kitchen sink, put an RO or, or more broadly. Point is, we're going to talk about that in fact today. Systems thinking. Systems of systems involves these human systems that we kind of touched on. And then it's interesting. Here we are on tail end, let's hope, God willing, of a pandemic. Mm-hmm. There's a good example of systems, right? Yeah. Systems of systems, like you're breathing, someone else is inhaling. Um, so we, we talked about these human systems, systems of humans, I call them, architects, appraisers, engineers. Those of you looking at the screen, I just brainstormed for a while, like lobbyists, industry associations, <laughs> legislators, you can see them here, manufacturers. There's a lot of cogs in that wheel. Yeah. Well, and, here, there you are. And I would you, notice YouTubers. that he put YouTubers on there and <laughs> IG influencers. <laughs> Healthcare companies, allergists. Um, we have had a lot of people referring their clients, allergists, referring their clients to us. Like, especially if they have like, you know, pediatric asthma cases or like, yeah. and it's not, there's no family history of asthma. It's like, let's send someone to their home. And I mean, I've, I've got a client of mine that has that issue and I've got a daughter that's got <sighs> asthma. So that I'm was a big you deal. Good for filters me. and dehumidifiers on you. Yeah, and house. I also the mistakes that I made in my first house, I didn't repeat in my next house. You know, like I made the mistake of putting carpet in several bedrooms. <laughs> Dumb. I mean, that well, was, no, that was, it's traditional practice. It was traditional practice, but you know, I was I was first cost focused mm -hmm, rather mm -hmm, than outcome mm -hmm. focused. And carpets feel good. Yeah, carpets it, do feel good. It's There's the no padding probably it. more than the carpets, but. Then the hell that house was. But when you have a daughter who has asthma, it's not smart to put her in a room no, carpeting because the, it holds everything. The ecosystem down there. Yeah. And in fact, on that PFAS topic, um, that has been pulled out of a lot of carpets. The big box stores are behind it. And that's a big deal. So so moving in, I, I know we don't want to bog down too much, but systems of systems, building science is systems of systems. Mm -hmm. And I'd say systems of knowledge is one of the big ones. Like I am very fortunate that I have, I'm, I'm like, really into it and I can keep up now where the indoor air quality research community and the building science community overlap. Mm. So you now we have building science overlapping with medical science. I think where you and I are today, this is building science interacting with social science. Mm. Where are the leverage points that cause society to ask for outcomes they didn't know were possible, right? That's right. It's information flow. And then there's social psychology, right? Like, well, the fact of the matter is that it, it is probably better, broadly speaking, for global society for more and more people to use electricity that was generated without fossil fuel emissions, right? But how do you, how do you quote, sell that to someone? There's on the screen here, social psychology, right? Like I can say to you, Matt, you're going to be independent. You're going to have independent power. It's going to be reliable whenever you need it. Or I can say, Matt, you're going to protect the planet for future generations. Both are true, but you're using psychology. <laughs> Yeah, you know, interesting point there. I, I would tell you that the word green building is dead. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, when I first mm -hmm. started blogging and then doing my uh, YouTube videos in 07, 08, I would 
I would call myself Matt Reisinger in the green building blog. Uh, and I was learning still at that time and still am today, a ton about building science, but I quickly found that that term green building got usurped with a bunch of other things mm -hmm. and lo it yeah. lost its meaning. Yeah. And people weren't uh, necessarily willing to pay for quote unquote green without me as a builder or you as a engineer being able to explain what the benefit to them was, you know, saving the earth, changing the climate. Those are great ethereal things. But as a nation, where does the rubber meet the road? It meets the road where today, how does that affect me? And that's why we typically talk about high performance building, about airtight buildings, about buildings that are more comfortable and more durable and efficient, which, oh, by the way, often means houses that are built to a very high green building yep. standard that have sustainability in mind. What's more sustainable, a house that's going to last 500 years or a house that's going to get torn and torn down in 50 years because <laughs> uh, it had mold growth and rats in it, like the house that I tore down to build right. my family a better house. Uh, yeah. so, you know, being able to just like your clients saying, all right, I don't care about solar. I don't care about, you know, making energy. Well, great. What do you care about? I care about health. Oh, interesting. A well-built house tends to build to be a healthy house. Uh, not necessarily, but typically. Oh yeah. Um, and great. You don't want solar. No problem. That's a bolt on, you know, uh, maybe the next owner will be interested in that, but if you're not, that's totally fine. Yeah. We're going to be able to build you a really good house. That's going to give you lots of good outcomes. Mm -hmm. This is a little bit of an adjacent uh, adjacent topic, but you know, here we are lo the, looking at the screen here about um, behavioral science, behavioral economics, marketing and consumer behavior, legislation, regulation, geology, oceanography, meteorology. It just goes on and on. The point is, though, that there's expertise that can be applied to making good decisions on your home, and there is a really fundamental asymmetry between most technologies. Like, face it, homes are technologically sophisticated today. Mm -hmm. Most technologies like my iPhone, no one asked me about the internal architecture of my iPhone. I go buy a new car. No one said to me, Christoph, do you want woven metal brake lines or do you want rubber brake lines, right? <laughs> they let the engineers that were the experts make the decisions. What happens in homes? Do you want flex duct or do you want metal duct, right? Like, whoa, wait a minute. We're asking the least expertised person in the whole interaction, you know, That's to right. make... So that, that's a that's. I a don't challenge. ask my clients that question. <laughs> I just do metal. Yeah. And I think, frankly, we are at a pivot point in the industry. The last three years or so, the next three years or so, so where both architects and builders are recognizing that with great power comes great responsibility yeah. and that they need to be, there's just certain things. I mean, there's lots of architects uh, in this city that are coming saying, hey, I have been listening and I am telling clients they can have the dirtiest, sootiest fireplace they want just outside. Mm -hmm. And we're doing rock wool CI on all our buildings. Just that that's our standard of care mm -hmm. as an architecture practice or a standard of care as a builder. They don't ask. Yep. Uh, yeah. And, and I think it's hard in the sense that um, other people might take their business out elsewhere because, you know, designing for low first cost and visual spatial aesthetics is really traditional <laughs> and pervasive. All right, let's let's For move sure. it. So we talked about this last time. The early in the project phase, when it's in concept or schematic, before it gets to design development or, or construction documents, you have these twin benefits of you can make the world is your oyster. You can have any outcomes you want, and they don't cost much early right. on. As soon as you move forward, it starts to cost more, and and you can't do as much. Totally. So we talked about the big three, you know, enclosure systems, mechanical systems, resilient systems. Resilient systems often slide under the radar, but we're talking about energy and water. So now all of you listening, just think about any, think about your favorite moment at your house. What, what was happening at that moment? Were you, uh, was it Thanksgiving? Was it your kid's birthday? You know, whatever it was, I would say almost 100% there was energy and water involved in that yeah you know they, they there's a commercial building expression called cold dark shell <laughs> imagine <laughs> yeah, cold dark dry shell or something yeah. right that's what that's what our homes were in the snowpocalypse yeah they were <laughs> and for those of you listening who don't remember oh, in texas man. this winter just uh i don't know 90 days or so ago we had a hundred and what was it like 152 hours in a row of below zero temperatures. Incredible. Which we're not used to in Texas. We hardly ever get more than 12 hours in a row below zero, which knocked out all kinds of power plants, chemical plants, 
Uh, it's even affecting us through the summer and probably likely into the fall because things like paints and cocks and sealants that involve some amount of chemical in them, including petroleum, those plants shut down for weeks and weeks or maybe months and months. But on a personal note, my family lost uh, power at our house for 52 hours. Uh, I happen to have a backup generator at my house. I have a champion uh, natural gas fired nice. uh, 12 kW generator that my wife thought I was a little crazy for installing uh, last fall. And I turned out to be a genius because I had <laughs> uh, at least one of their family come and stay with me uh, for several days. Yeah. And some of my clients that I built houses for that were in other neighborhoods of the city, uh, I have at least two of them that lost power for seven days. Mm. Uh, and I'll admit I made a couple of dumb mistakes in those houses when it comes to resiliency. I put at least on one of those houses, some exterior tankless water heaters on, mm. well, on several houses that I built years ago. I don't do that as much anymore, but, uh, several of those units froze, mm -hmm. uh, and mm -hmm. burst on them when the power came back on and, and when the temperatures warmed up. So I made, I made some, uh, mistakes from a resiliency perspective and, I also have some great stories from other clients who said, gosh, you know, even though the power was out for multiple days, my house never got all that cold because it was so airtight and so well insulated. Yeah. And that was great to hear. I really appreciated that. Yeah. And my house, which you guys helped me design, uh, we'll see if I get passive house certification. Yeah, it's but I'm, built like that. I'm going for passive house certification and I've got about 2x code insulation levels everywhere. Mm -hmm. Uh, and very, very airtight envelope. I'll definitely meet the standard for airtightness. Uh, if the snowpocalypse would have happened uh, after I moved in, uh, I might have needed a small generator to uh, turn some lights on or to charge my phone, but I would not have needed it for heat. Absolutely. Yeah, I think that it's one of the key takeaways from today, I think, is that when we're talking about resilient systems, I already kind of misspoke and said it's about energy and water. It is about the enclosure. The, the ultimate battery in a home is the enclosure. Mm -hmm. What do you do? You charge your enclosure up with comfortable, healthy indoor conditions. Yep. And you want them to stay that way. Yep. So that that is really where you invest. And personally, um, I was out without power for four days. I was without water. My pipes burst. I had a sand and heat pump water heater. I did not get to shut it off gracefully. It just froze up. Exterior <laughs> you know, lines. Um, I was so impressed at, you know, once I thawed it out and I had some copper that burst. Quite exciting to see that. And uh, once I fixed those leaks, plugged it back in, started it back up, boom. Just oh, man. Bomber reliable, awesome. super. So let's, so let's do resilience now. So there is a definition of resilience. There's a longer definition, but the one I like is resilience is the capacity to bounce back hmm. after a disturbance or interruption. Resilience is like really that. this idea that unexpected stuff's going to happen. You're going to be without energy you're going to be without water and chances are good in fact this is one of the things the governor probably could have warned texas a little better mm -hmm. like hey by the way this is coming um but chances are good that you know power a tree's going to take a power line down and it's not going to send you an email ahead of time so <laughs> it's just going to it's just going to happen and so you have now is the time to um prepare for it so resilient systems whether it's we talked about this whether it's to provide for independence or to protect the environment, the, f the reality is that many owners and project teams are rethinking traditional utility services. If there's one thing we can say with pretty strong confidence is that all of us in this room, the last 50 years of being connected to the power grid and the water grid are not indicative representative of the next 50 years. Mm -hmm. the, these systems are changing. This slide has a ton of words, but I'm just going to tell you that resilient systems help you improve the outcome. They help you reduce the costs for energy and water, and they help you when you're designing a home today, please design it so that you don't have to bring a bobcat around to trench your home, trench your yard later to put in a cistern or to put in conduit to get a battery or a solar array. One of the things that thinking about resilient systems as part of the early design phase is to say, you might not want solar today. You might not want batteries today. But if you want to get past the Mr. Potato Head model of solar, which is my house already exists, and now I'm just going to pop these ears on. <laughs> Mr. Potato Head, I like that. <laughs> yeah, you got to do that. So resilient design is about mitigating the impacts, right? And this means like your, your um, enclosure is a battery. Mm -hmm. And then it's an adaptation, like what am I going to do when the power goes out? So here, in fact, is the Mr. Potato Head model shown, right? There's a, uh, I don't know, 
I pulled these images off the web, some ugly solar panel designs. Like, you know, there are a lot of people, well, we mentioned this, I don't believe mm -hmm. in solar. What they really probably mean is, I think it looks ugly. I think it looks stupid. I don't want a home that looks like that. So yeah, yeah get these, past. these houses on these images look pretty ugly. We yeah. can all think of that one house in some neighborhood that has solar on them. Mr. Potato Head really model. ugly. That's the, but it can be designed very thoughtfully, incorporated in. Like, what do, what do you see from the street? What don't you? And so what we're showing here. I actually, on a random side note here, please. I got a call from Tesla Solar and they're getting an install going in Austin uh, that they want me to go out and video and talk about Tesla Solar, which I think is a cool system because it's fully integrated into the roof panels mm -hmm. you don't really know necessarily that there's solar there you, if you look closely you can tell um, but it's a pretty cool system and what i've always said about solar that i like about it is that it's a um uh, gosh am i using the right term a static system mm -hmm. meaning there's no moving parts once you set it you kind of forget it mm -hmm. and, uh, and writ, writ large across our society it is a technology mm -hmm. And what is it that we're great at? I was gonna say here in the United States, but globally, we can make computer chips cheaper and more powerful and better, you know, same thing. So that's gonna happen. What we're seeing here is a color-coded roof diagram showing that where the tree shading is affecting the production of the Tesla solar panels. And mm -hmm. and we should we should do like a little separate podcast just about the different solar options that are out there. I like that. Um, so we start, this is really important to recognize that when we're, when we're designing resilient systems, well, let me let me rephrase that. When we are talking about the options that owners have for resilient systems early in the design phase, when the sky's the limit, we are really listening to the owners. Mm -hmm. We're doing a detailed interview. And then what we're presenting in our report is, here's what we heard you say. So we always present a draft report first, hmm. do an iteration or two, and then make a final report. So what we're showing here is a slide that says, here's what we heard you ask for. And this slide actually is fully off-grid energy posture desired. Ooh. Grid power is a long way away. There are a lot of people, um, you know, the COVID has led to the fight, flight, or freeze response. And a lot of people are uh, kind of fleeing to their their fiefdom, their nest, their mm -hmm. playground. Yep. And, you know, I'm not saying that's a bad thing at all. I'm kind of doing that myself. But a lot of times these are, these are rural properties where it's like, oh, it's actually 200K to bring power to this site. Oh, what can I do with solar for 200K? And it turns out in this project quite a bit. 200K, dang. Yeah, long, long runs, especially if they don't want telephone, um, not telephone, uh, power poles, mm -hmm. right? They want to oh, bury right, it. Oh, right, yeah. You got to bury it. And then you got tree roots, you know? And mm -hmm. so what we what we do is we, we create a physics-based model of the home and we can uh, show the energy production. In fact, buried in here is uh, those light, the blue graphs is showing heating energy, cooling energy, electric cars, water heating, indoor lighting and equipment. Hmm. And then the green is energy production, right? So you can see this home, it is, it's a, it's a small it's home. It's positive. It's got heat pump, water heaters, it's got great insulation. So it is not having a big draw and it is net positive, exactly right. So we look at different basis of designs, right? So in architecture terms, there's these things called owner's project requirement, that's what the intake interview established, what do you want? And then, then we as engineers and experts, we can then translate what we heard you ask for into a basis of design. So for these people, we, we said, what you want is an off-grid solar with generator and battery backup. And then we can draw basis of design, actually diagrams. We're showing a system diagram here from the transformer and it has the solar feeding in, it has a generator feeding in. We're showing where the islandable loads are, where the battery energy storage system is. What this does is, this is something now, and, and we will show the, this is a 6KW array or a 12KW array. We will show this to the owner, educating the owner such that now when they hire a solar installer, they have had neutral third-party advice and they understand what to ask for, right? Super so same smart. thing here, we have off-grid design with battery. There are a range, right? Tesla is, you know, Tesla for both solar and batteries. One thing they're doing is they're putting them on the map. They're putting it in people's minds. Mm -hmm. And so that does not mean that they are always the best option, right? But boy, they're good at marketing. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I've had several of my random friends who've had roof uh, replacement call me and go, hey, I got to replace my roof anyways from hail or whatever. What do you think about Tesla solar roof? You know, I got a quote from them for this. Plus, they want to sell the battery as well. It's part of the deal. Right. And these are people that are not builders, that are not, uh, you know, they, they at least one or two of them owned a Tesla. 
and figured, well, my Tesla car is awesome. Why yeah. wouldn't I have them do my roof? Too? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, I mean, just a, a short, another kind of like good takeaway here is that the characteristics of the ideal battery to serve a house depend on the home's loads. Mm -hmm. And so depending on the scale of the home, um, a Tesla might or might not be the right thing to do. So this slide is actually, slide is actually showing generators and batteries and then smart panels, right? So these automatic load shifting panels that island the fridge, mm -hmm. for instance, or island, if it's a big home, power goes out, you, you and I are gonna have said, where do you wanna have your safe zone, right? Chances are, well, or you could spend more money and say your whole house is your safe zone. <laughs> but chances are, we're gonna say, let's pick a not highly glazed area, mm -hmm. right? Because if it's winter, or actually it's winter or summer, it's gonna be harder to keep that heated and cooled. Let's keep the fridge on. Um, it might be the master bedroom, master suite is mm -hmm. like, that's where the family's gonna congregate if there's a power failure and that's all, all the plugs and outlets are gonna be on. Anyway. And the other thing that's now caught, me, the water that's caught me is yeah, I, I actually am, I've not done a great job of planning for solar other than I know I want it. <laughs> but in thinking about backup generators in solar, one of the things that's got me on, an, uh, basically I'm, I've disconnected my house from natural gas, I'm all electric. And one of, the thing, one of the things that's caught me a little bit off guard is, oh, dang, I got a induction cooktop that uses a freaking ton of amperage when it's running, especially if you had like all the burners on. Uh, that kicks you into a whole nother category for almost everything. It does. When you're thinking about backup generators and solar and all that kind of stuff. So suddenly my current house, which has natural gas for cooking and natural gas for heating and several other things, I only needed a 12 kW and I energized my entire 200 amp panel, knowing that I had to be a little cautious about circuits, but I wasn't gonna have a problem with heat, I wasn't gonna have a problem cooking, some of that kind of stuff. Suddenly in my new house, oh, and water heating too, it was natural gas in my current house. At my new house, I have a sand and heat pump water heater. <laughs> I've got Mitsubishi VRF heating and cooling. I've yeah. got an induction cooktop from Mila, uh, and I've got a garage or fridge, cause I've got a big family and all these things that I'm like, oh gosh, I need more of everything than I thought I needed yeah. or than I may have had in the past with a different fuel source. Yeah. So part of the intake interview will be, Matt, how long do you want to stay safe in your home? Mm -hmm. Right. So I would say anyone hiring you, you know, in fact, standard of care, I would love it if Risinger Build would say, we're going to give you one day standard, 24 hours. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, maybe not full loads, but may, most of the home, you got 24 hours to decide where you want to go. Would you rather go three days? Would you rather go seven days? Would you rather go indefinitely? We have just said ka-ching, ka-ching, ka-ching yep. significantly. Yep. However, those those ka-chings are going to shift radically um, over time because this is an evolving area and I, I know we need to start moving on. I do want to say that Dr. Charlie Upshaw with my team would be a great guest to bring back on. Yeah, he would be. Dig in there. Charlie's awesome. So let's blaze through some water. And Charlie is our resident energy and water Uber nerd. So now we're showing the owner's project requirements, what we heard about water at the intake interview. And I would just say generally that energy, maybe because of Tesla gets all the glamor. We need the, the Tesla of water systems. If you live at home and you have energy and you have no water, you will notice right away, you use water a lot. Oh yeah. Yeah, cooking, cleaning, bathing, drinking. So it is absolutely the case that um, water quality and reliability are, are highly suspect. Mm -hmm. And Charlie can speak more to that. So. What we have is the ability while, again, while the project is still very fluid and the decisions are not locked in, we estimate the water use. We estimate the production capacity. We're going to show you the optimal cistern tank size. Here's an example of locating a cistern under a swimming pool, hmm. right? We go through here and we show, we're showing lots of different uh, cistern options from site-built concrete, precast concrete, underground, plastic fiberglass tanks, and they go on and on. Metal cistern, plastic cisterns, you can get concrete or wooden cisterns that are above ground. So now we're, we're, we're in each one of them, we're de describing the pluses and minuses to the clients. So now they can, frankly, they can go shop wisely for cisterns. We then, we show water quality components. Like here's, and notice on the bottom right here on this screen, we're showing you need seven to eight feet minimum of linear wall space, right? We're showing where the reverse osmosis goes. Right now, since this is another thing, um, since the pandemic, we have been doing indoor air quality consulting for commercial, um, you know, schools and music venues and things like that. Um, quick aside, 
conditioned space can be designed to prevent uh, transmission of viruses and bacteria between mm. people through breathing, right? Or it cannot be. So it's very powerful. Um, but we're talking about now, we're talking about extreme events. This is another thing. We ha we all live through a snow apocalypse. So do yep. my engineers. So now we're talking about emergency buffer capacity and, and making sure that on your critical loads panel, first of all, that you have one and making sure that on it is the is your water system so you can get it. And then very last thing is that we also are talking about future climate considerations to our clients. We are mm -hmm. not um, telling them they need to be preppers, but we're, we are in fact building into our models anticipated rainfall changes and anticipated heat load changes. So then we model how long they can last in, in an extreme event outage. And you can see on here, we are saying to them, if it's an extreme event, technically keeping your home above 40 degrees Fahrenheit, right? That reduces the most thermal stress on the bodies. Now it's higher, 65 if you're older or very young, but we're gonna say to you, Matt, the doo-doo hit the fan, you got no power. It's an extreme event. How long do you want to coast for? And are you willing for us to model that your house is maintained at 45 F, you mm -hmm. know, instead of whatever, whatever you keep it 68 or yep. 70 something yep. in the winter. So quick summaries, right? This idea of the earth is flat. I have that up on the screen now. That's just an example of these, these fixed ideas. These are called paradigms. There are deep seated stories. They are so deep that we don't notice them, but they affect all our decisions, right? Are the sources for energy and water worth considering, right? From the perspectives of reliability, availability, quality, and, and cost, frankly. Um, quick, super quick aside on that. A lot of our homes, a lot of our clients, these are second homes, vacation homes. Mm -hmm. Put a big solar array and a battery on a second home, or even just a big solar array. If you're not home and you're not using that power, energy arbitrage is coming, right? Time yeah. of use pricing. You can start to think about your second home as a little uh, utility. Yeah. So how do we do this, right? This is this is kind of where you and I are in the industry. Like how do we encourage people individually and collectively? What turns their lights on? A lot of them are waiting for these unicorn clients as we call them. And I, I really hope that what we can recognize is, we mentioned this already, that architects, engineers, builders, all of us have some agency into the decisions that get made and it's kind of like with our power comes our responsibility mm -hmm. to to constantly learn and grow and, and nuance what we recommend. And my very last slide is this one where, I mean, this is, this is a big deal and it's subtle, but I have these six words on the screen. Doing better, doing things better, doing things better and doing better things. We are really in a cycle of doing things better. We're, we're, we're like saying the traditional process and practices are okay, but we're constantly going to pull out this material and put in this material. But the we're still doing the same things, mm -hmm. which is not inappropriate. And it's also true that right now, we also need to add to that very strikingly, we need to do things better. Um, it's kind of like social pressure built up and built up and built up. And then there was tremendous social change in the United States in the 1960s, right? We're at a spot in the building industry where there's pressure building up that are saying traditional practices are leading to outcomes people don't want. It's building up and building up and building up. And I'm going to go out on a limb and say, in 10 years, we're going to see more hempcrete buildings. We're going to see more rammed earth buildings. You know, we're going to see cisterns and storage and solar at far more common than it is today. Mm -hmm. And that's that's all I came to say. So thank you so much. Man, Christoph, always good talking building <laughs> science and the future of building with you. Yeah. Guys, if you're not familiar, Christoph publishes his uh uh, I wanted to call it a blog, your podcast. We sorry. do have a little blog. We do have a little blog. <laughs> you do have a blog. That's true. That feels so. Uh, I shouldn't say little. It's 2005 to me. Uh, <laughs> but I blogged for many years too. Yeah. I, I still often get referred to as a blogger. Um, but, anyways, go follow these guys. The Building Science Podcast, right? Isn't that what you guys are called on iTunes? Correct. Uh, and however you're consuming this, there'll be a link of some variety down below uh, to Positive Energy's website. Uh, to the Building Science Podcast uh, and also to their Instagram feed because you guys have a great Instagram feed as well. Uh, these are a really smart group of people that have helped me a ton over the years uh, to design and build better houses um, with better outcomes for my clients. Uh, and I'm so thankful that your organization uh, exists because <laughs> before I met you, uh, there was a hodgepodge of things that I did that were not great. Uh, and now that I've uh, been using you guys for, I don't know, 12, 13 years now, 
the buildings that I build are much, much better. Can, I, can I make a quick comment on that? Please before do. Before we leave. So yeah, I was a residential builder for many years, for about 15 years. And I know that part of being a good builder is to be a motive force, is to be like, this will happen. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, there's no copy paste to start over if you screwed something up. It takes resolve. It takes <laughs> grit. It takes a lot of effort and discipline and exertion to, to be in that role. And unfortunately, along with that is like all those things I just said, there's not a lot of room for humility. There's not a lot mm -hmm. of benefit for builders to have the mindset that say, what am I not seeing? Mm -hmm. What am I not doing? What paradigms do I have in my head that are outdated, right? And so it is true that, you know, if you think about architects and builders, right? Architects are pushing a little faster right now and builders are like the bumper, the guardrail. Mm -hmm. Like, nah, I don't know, I don't know, let's not go so fast. I don't know about this OSB, you know? And so my point is that you had, I don't know what it was, the humility, mm -hmm. the personal integrity, um, just, family of origin perspective gave you the the mindset to say what can i do better i appreciate that yeah so yeah we we need more of that that's my that's been my mindset and my goal over the years has been to build every house a little better than the last house awesome uh and i think there's a lot of like my i mean if you're listening to this podcast you're most likely like -minded. you're like-minded uh not too many people that are uh the youtube haters uh, are probably listening to this podcast right now. <laughs> we are uh, preaching to the choir, as the uh, old saying goes. So, and it's an honor to do so for sure, guys. Uh, follow me on Twitter, Instagram. Go follow the the Building Science podcast on iTunes as well. Otherwise, we'll see you next time on the Build Show podcast. <laughs>